Welcome to CivilNet. We're joined again by documentary filmmaker Emil Gerson. Emil, thanks again for joining us. Cheers, thanks. So to start off, you are working on a documentary film with regards to the Second Karabakh War. Can you tell us a bit about where you're at with the film and when we can expect it? Yeah, so it's been a long journey. It's been five months now. Um, we're now in post-production, so we're currently editing here in Armenia. Um, we were supposed to be editing in the USA, but we, I couldn't get a visa because COVID. So we decided to edit here in Armenia and it, it, it works better for us anyway being here because there's still things we're following up, research, facts and figures, so it's easier working here. Another question to do with journalism. A, a lot of the journalists which gained attention, I think, during the Karabakh War were working independently. Um, why do you think this is? Why do you think so many independent journalists in a way managed to convey the story better than ones that came with an outlet and were in and out? The way the media works now is independents generally do a lot of the groundwork for mainstream media by going out there, the costs are lower, the cheaper for independents to get out there. So main mainstream companies will buy footage off independents. And not only that is mainstream media has an agenda, they have a narrative. So when it comes to wars and conflicts like this, if it doesn't suit the narrative of the mainstream company, they won't cover the war. Um, so that's why there's so many independents that came to this conflict on the Armenian side. Do you think also to an extent, um because they're working for certain outlets, they have to be more careful to avoid places that might be risky, whereas independent journalists seem to be far more ready to go to places yeah. that are really hot zones. Yeah, totally. It's, I've worked for mainstreams before and there's so, so much red tape. You have to do um, health and safety risk assessments. And I think in this war with the drone threat, I don't think main, mainstream companies were prepared to put their staff in, at risk. There, of course, there were some companies that were actively working, but over, overall, to get to a war that happens very quickly, independents can move a lot faster than mainstream media companies. And I want to also talk about this drone theme because we're trying to understand what was different about this war compared to other conflicts. I mean, you were there and, and you saw how these drones were operating, but can you explain from a military standpoint what that meant to have that many drones in the air? Yeah, so my time in the military, we used drones effectively. But they were like large-scale drones, very expensive. The drones that Turkey and Azerbaijan were using were low-cost drones, um, loitering drones that were warheads built into the drones that would circulate for hours on end and then detonate into a target as a warhead, as a drone. So because there was a lot cheaper drones out there on the market, because we've evolved militarily around the world, um, they would use them effectively. And in the footage I've got, speaking to a lot of the soldiers, especially that were coming out of Shushi on on the 11th of um, November. And I say to one of them, is, is gonna be in a documentary. I'm like, what, what was it like with the drones? And he goes, the drones were like stars. We didn't know if it was a drone or a star because there's so many of them. And so really in this war, it's been fundamental for the Zeris and how they've won this war is through the drone warfare. And around the world, the world has been watching this war as it plays out. So I think it's gonna change future wars. Well, apart from uh, the drone aspect, a lot of people have been speaking about how the Armenian armed forces uh, were inferior from the Azerbaijani armed forces in terms of equipment, for example, and gear. Did you, did you notice that? Did you notice anything about the Armenian army which was surprising and maybe kind of a red flag? Mm, well, the footage we've got in the documentary, when we're highlighting in the documentary, is that there was young soldiers that were using weapons that were older than their fathers that were used from the 60s. And so the technology difference, was, it was a game changer in the sense that the drone is technology war against young men and old men with AK-47s and old Soviet military um, hardware like tanks. And tanks are obsolete now. Even in the British Armed Forces, they talk about getting rid of tanks because against the aerial threat of drones, they're useless. And I think very much in this war, the Armenians weren't prepared. They weren't equipped for what they were facing. And it was even basic stuff like sleeping bags where so many thousands of men went to the front line as volunteers. Some of them didn't have boots, didn't have the basics, let alone weapons. So yeah, they're doubt, definitely outgunned. I mean, some Artsakh authorities have even spoken about uh, desertion that was going on, especially in the southern front in areas like Hadrut. Um, of course, though, you're speaking about uh, the military capabilities Azerbaijan had. Isn't it, in a way, understandable for these battalions to desert in certain areas of the front? But 
soldiers deserted and that comes down to command and control of their their commanders it's not the individuals the individuals if they were led correctly as they should have been they wouldn't have deserted and i think there was definitely a lack of command and control amongst the armenian military lots of volunteers who were on the front line who didn't know what they were doing i've heard stories from soldiers saying their commander would just disappear they were told to stay in an area and their commander would go and it's like so as a young guy who doesn't really know anything about tactics and is not a professional soldier and people saying, oh, they're deserted. They're, they're not cowards, these men, they're from the Armenian soldiers. None of them are cowards. A lot of them fought to the death. Um, but if they weren't the command and control, what are they going to do? They're going to leave these positions if they're outgunned and are going to be overrun. And a lot of the conflicts you've uh, been in service in and also covered have been conflicts that were inter-country. They were usually civil conflicts or um, uh, insurgencies. But this was two sovereign internationally recognized states fighting against each other. Do you think there's anything in particular about that which change, changes the nature of how a war is conducted? Yeah, totally. When, it, when you've got state against state, rather than non-state actors that are playing in it, the rules should be, there should be more rules in war. And normally even my body armor, so when I was out in Iraq, Syria and Ukraine, because it was an insurgent campaign, I would wear camouflage body armor, before here I was wearing black with press written on it expecting that the Zeris, because I was documenting from the Armenian side that the Zeris would recognise that. But within this war, totally, that even though it's been state actors playing, I think the Zeris side haven't been playing by the rules of, rules of war. And it sounds quite weird to some people probably watching this to go about rules, but even warfare, there is rules. And we've seen time after time, the Zeris breaking rules, um, using of certain weapons, targeting civilian areas. Um, and not only that, is the use of Syrian mercenaries, which is something that needs to be highlighted by the international community. And um, something else which some people found surprising, I found surprising, is how many servicemen you will meet that um, are hopeful that there will be a peaceful settlement of, of the conflict. And this is the case in many military conflicts uh, around, the, uh, around the world. What do you think about that? What do you think about... Um, uh, hearing servicemen who are in favour actually of a lasting uh, peace settlement with Azerbaijan or even normalisation agreements with Azerbaijan and Turkey. Yeah, well, since the age of 18 I've been in war zones in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Iraq um, and, and Ukraine and, and here now. And war's not nice. And for soldiers, I'm hearing mixed opinions among soldiers. Some soldiers are expecting another war and then other soldiers are going, it's time to just move on. Um, so it is a mixed messaging that's coming back, but really for anyone to advocate a further war, I, I would not support personally. Um, it needs to be done through diplomacy, and this is where governments need to sit down and talk. But at the moment, Armenia isn't pulling the strings here. The, the people that are conducting what's going on here is Turkey and Russia. And when you've got major state players like Turkey and Russia, it's geopolitics here is going to be muddled for many years to come. And, a lot of people are expecting another war. People were saying in April, there was going to be, March, April, there's going to be another war. I don't think in immediate term there's going to be a war while the Russians are here. And um, another topic I'm quite interested in is mental health and, and post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. I think in the UK, uh, to an extent, the stigma around that has been lifted. But what I'm interested in is uh, how this issue applies to servicemen and the armed forces. In Armenia, there definitely is a sick stigma about servicemen seeking that sort of attention. So what do you think about this subject and what can you tell us about servicemen in general and their relation to PTSD and seeking mental health? Yeah, post-traumatic stress is massive amongst all genders um, and walks of life. But here, especially in this, in this war, I think so many young men weren't prepared to go to war. And they went to war and it was a bloody war. For 44 days, it was an extremely bloody war for the Armenian side and the Azeri side. Um, so lots of men have got trauma from this. Not only that, I think the fact is that Armenia lost the war. And so a lot of young men I've spoke to, they feel as though they've let down their family. They've got this survivor's guilt that their friends died and they survived, they should have died. Um, so I think there's definitely a massive issue with post-traumatic stress here with soldiers. And I don't think they're doing enough to support these soldiers. I don't think that the infrastructure's there. And like you're saying, in the UK and in the, in the Western world, talk about mental health as a man is now encouraged. And a lot of my friends from the military, there's no shame in talking about mental health. So it's just as important as physical health. Um, but I think here in Armenia, there's a massive stigma with it. And I think that comes with education. But I don't think it's just the soldiers that got post-traumatic stress. It's 
everyone, survived, everyone involved in this conflict, and if it's the families, it's the people that have um, been living in areas and now lost their homes, and even down to the diaspora who've been having this guilt um, through the intra trauma for generations has gone on here. So I think mental health is important across the board for everyone um, that's involved in the Armenian conflict. And I know you entered from Armenia into Karabakh literally around the time the November 9th agreement was, was signed. Can you tell us about that day? What exactly happened? How did you enter? Yeah, so I was, I was, in, the, I was on the front line filming. I then returned um, back to the UK, then came back again to continue filming. And then about three o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call and said, something's going on in Republic Square. So I went down there. So we were filming what was going on. Um, on people not knowing what's going on, Pashyan doing this, um, a live Facebook talk and people stood around the car and we got all this footage for the documentary. And then we heard about the Russian peacekeepers moving in. So me and the cameraman, we jumped in the car, we drove to Goris and we literally pulled up at Goris just before um, the border crossing point where all the Russian tanks were lined out. And we've got the footage of them turning their engines on and then moving up. So for six hours, we just followed the Russians in. Um, and the Russians thought we were Armenian journalists the Armenians thought we were with the Russians, so there's all these armoured vehicles driving into Karabakh and there's just our white hire car in and amongst all the tanks. And we got short of Shushi by about 20 kilometres. Um, we pushed all the way to the front of the vehicles, thinking we can get down into the panico. And the Russians are like, you can't go any further because it's too dangerous. We don't know where the Zeris are. We don't know where the forward line is. So we turned around, drove back round to the north and came in through the south. And then we met the Russians that had come through down past Shushi and into the panico. So yeah, it was really just being a bit ballsy and getting up there to get the story. Yeah, uh, and I'm interested, what do you think Ar Armenia should do now? Many believe army reform is essential, others uh, think that a lasting peace settlement should be arranged, others say both. So I don't know, are there any sorts of recommendations, things you've seen in your time in Armenia that you could say at least something that I really think Armenia should pursue? Well, from my experience from the military side of things, what I would say is the Armenians need to conform their military to more NATO standard, as in training. I think still there's that Soviet mentality amongst the military on how they fight, which is outdated, it's old school. And the Zeris are very much have been trying to align themselves with NATO standards or way of fighting. I think Armenia needs to start sourcing closer relationships with NATO, or if not, private, private companies that do military training. Um, I know several people that I was in the military with that provide a service where they go to countries and they teach the local forces, train the trainer um, to bring them up to a standards. I think definitely within the Armenian military, they need to be a reform. I think the, ho the high commanders need re-educating on how to fight future modern day conflicts because at the moment, it's still very much Soviet era. Yeah, well, Emil, thank you very thank much you. for your time again. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on Civil Net.